So I want to welcome everybody and thank all the the, the presents who, who uh, agreed to come here and, and give talks. I think we managed to put up a, a very nice program. And our first speaker will be Professor Ilan Goldfarb from the um, uh, Department of Material Science and Engineering in the Faculty of Engineering. And he will talk about filamentary conduction in nanometer. Thank you, Tal, and uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizing committee here for inviting me, not just inviting me, but to open this 10th uh, year jubilee and this beautiful resort. Uh, I'm sure we will all enjoy staying here. <laughs> and um, normally, I would uh, talk to you about uh, epitaxial nanostructures, scanning tunneling microscopy. But today, I want to talk about something very, very different. And, uh, and that's uh, um, that conduction in uh, devices, memory devices called MemRistor, based on uh, metal oxides. And as you can see here in green, <coughs> uh, I was. Uh, I started doing this uh, during my sabbatical at the uh, Hewlett Packard Labs in Palo Alto. And I'd like to start by thanking, acknowledging all my colleagues there, especially Stan Williams for uh, giving me this great opportunity and entering into the wonderful world of uh, memristors. So when I arrived at HP Labs, Stan asked me what would I like to do. And he said, you know, we have a UHVSTM if you want. And I said, no, no, I don't want to do anything that I've done before. So I want to do something completely different. I said, okay, then you should, you know, join my uh, Memristor group. And I said, fantastic. The only problem was I had no idea what's a Memristor. How many of you know what Memristor is? Figures. Okay, so then I started reading about it, and it turns out that it's based on metal oxides, which I've never done before. So that was great. And then, turns out they are amorphous, which I've definitely never done before. That was great too. Then, to grow them, I started to use sputtering, which is not my thing, which is MBE, and to top it up, I decided to analyze it with photoemission, which I've never done before as well, <clears throat> neither. <clears throat> so that was great, something I've never done before and had no idea what it was. So let me introduce you to what Nimbrister is. So we all know the four fundamental circuit variables, electric current, voltage, charge, and magnetic flux. And these give us the three passive circuit elements that we know very well resistance, capacitance, and inductance. Now, if we look at the relations between these four variables, we know that current is the divergence of uh, charge with respect to time, and voltage divergence of uh, magnetic flux with respect to time. And we also know what relates current and voltage. Of course, it's resistance. And then voltage and charge, which is capacitance. And finally, magnetic flux and current which is inductance. And that's what we know. So what about this corner? Well, it looks asymmetrical. And uh, Leon Chua, Professor Leon Chua, in 1971, submitted that just out of sheer symmetry consideration, there must be a fourth passive element of electric circuit, which he called memristor. In other words, memory resistor, which should be defined like that. And it remained a uh, theoretical curiosity until 2008. So almost 30 years, um, actually more than 30 years. So uh, until in HP Labs, they realized the first Memristor. And what they realized is that basically Memristor
can be defined like that. If voltage is not just a function of uh, resistance and current, but also resistance is a function of some state variable, let's say W, and which is defined in the second equation, coupled equation, then obviously if it defines like that, that can be charged. And we have the charge memristor. In general, though, we have this uh, state variable W, which can be anything. And what they did in uh, HP labs in 2008, they realized the first memristor by defining the state variable as the width of the doped region in a titanium oxide. So if you look here, if you imagine a titanium oxide which is doped in this part and undoped in that part, and now we bias, we basically uh, apply voltage between the electrodes, then of obviously the, the drift of dopants will cause the uh, W part grow until ultimately it spans the entire device and then it becomes D. So it can be explained by this equivalent circuit of uh, potentiometers, two potentiometers. And if we think about voltage division, so voltage division will look like this. And eventually, we can define memristons as a function of, in this case, uh, uh, W, the uh, width of the doped region. And we can see the memristor function. And the, the nice part about this, which is not theoretical, is that in that case, an IV curve is supposed to be in the shape of a so-called pinch hysteresis, like here. Or in other words, it's like famous Lissajou figure, which we all know and love. And if it is the case, we can definitely use it as a switch using the high resistance state and the low resistance state and have a very nice switch. In fact, it is so nice that a couple of years ago, ITRS, the International uh, Semiconductor um, Roadmap, uh, nominated memristors to replace the uh, flash memories as non-volatile RAMs. And it's about to happen quite soon. And this is the first memristor, historic uh, real memristor made of titan titanium oxide. Um, but it turns out that tantalum oxide is actually better, uh, gives better performances than titanium oxide. It does not require electroforming, which is the first uh, operation to make it conductive. Then uh, also it has a very low energy consumption. It has very high endurance and very high ratio between on and off, so it's very non-volatile. And it's very fast. In switching, we're talking about switching time of less than two nanoseconds. So what happens there? How come this uh, uh, insulating layer, all the oxides, as you know, are insulating, how come it, bega it begins to uh, conduct when you apply uh, uh, bias across it? And people realize that it's not that the entire active layer begins to conduct, but some, let's call them conducting channels, formed, and basically they uh, short the electrodes, top electrodes and bottom electrodes, and they are the one responsible for conduction. And then um, when we turn the polarity, we break that filament, and we have high resistance state. Then we switch the, uh, the polarity back, and we rebuild that channel, and it's the low resistance state. So we have the on and off or set and reset operation. And uh, it can be also monopolar, but I will not get into this during this talk. I will talk about only bipolar. Bipolar means that, as we can see here, that in order to switch from on to off, we need to change the polarity, not just the uh, magnitude of the bias. So this is the operation as it is uh, perceived to be in t titanium oxide. So we see the forming operation during which a conducting filament is formed. Then we see the rupture of the conduction filament when we do the reset operation. 
And then when we do set, it rebuilds again. So what I've uh, set as, as my goals and objectives in this case is to do, to understand uh, better what's going on in those oxides. And basically, I, I define this material science of electronic processes and amorphous binary alloys. And that's, in fact, uh, by synthesizing uh, those layers and inspecting their composition and electronic structure, uh, we could get actually the desired properties of our memristor, which is, as we all know, the holy grail of material science. So uh, that means band structure and transport. And later on, I did some other things, which if there's time, I, I will mention here. And the reason why I picked up sputtering and um, photo emission is because when Stan gave me a tour, I stumbled into this little room with this machine. It looked very appealing to me. And turns out that this is sputtering, which is connected in situ to a photo emission machine. So this is the back side of this. Here we can see the load lock of the sputtering machine. This is the load lock sputtering machine. And then if you look from the back, we see this channel, this sleeve, through which I can move it into the photo emission machine, which has uh, not only photo emission, uh, XPS, UPS, it also had OG and other things. So photo emission, of course, is a very powerful tool. Because when we ionize, <clears throat> when, when we actually irradiate uh, a material, we knock out a core electron, and then we measure the binding energy using the photoelectric equation, and from which we can deduce the composition of the, uh, our material. And more importantly, we can get a very important information about chemical bonding. So it's not only elemental composition, but basically valence states or phases, compounds, if you will. And furthermore, we can also knock out electrons from the valence band at a lot lower energies, and that will give us the idea about electronic structure. So by using both core level spectra and the valence band spectra, we can get a very good idea about the composition of electronic structure of our material. And furthermore, by varying the incidence angle, we can get angle resolved photo emission, the so-called ARPES. So what materials? So titanium oxide was studied pretty well. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, this is the tantalum oxide phase diagram. And it is very, very simple. And as you will see, this is a key point. Uh, this is a very simple two-phase diagram. So under the eutectic line here, we, we only have a mixture of two phases, the solid solution of oxygen and tantalum and tantalum pentoxide, which is the terminal phase in this phase diagram. Then a different diagram is that of niobium oxide, because in addition to the two terminal phases, it has intermediate phases, as you can see here. And finally, the most complicated one is tungsten oxide, because in addition to those intermediate phases, it has a series of so-called Magnelli phases, which are very, very close in composition, but nevertheless, different phases. So I picked up the three uh, uh, material system, tantalum, tungsten, and uh, niobium oxides, in order to see how the phase diagram, among other things, affects the performance. And let me show you uh, the XPS analysis of those three oxide layers. What I did, I started with pure metals in each case and started to mix in oxygen into the argon, into, into the plasma, in order to introduce more and more oxygen to the growing films. And you can see that when we start, we have the typical metallic doublet, which is the 4F uh, for tungsten and uh, tantalum and 3D for niobium. And in the valence band, we can see the 5D, the typical protruding famous 5D band of those metals, or 4D in case of tungsten. And then when you start oxidizing, you see the changes that happen. And the changes that happen is that we begin to get oxides. And as we get more and more oxides, each oxide or each valence state is shifted with respect to the metallic state, and very conveniently by quite a lot. 
We're talking about, let's say, at least one electron volt to the higher energies, which means that I can easily deconvolute them by using peak fitting procedure. And at the same time, as we get those oxides, we begin to see the formation of the valence band here, okay, at the expense of the D band. And this trend continues and continues and continues. And eventually, we end up with pure uh, terminal oxide. So tantalum pentoxide and niobium pentoxide and tungsten trioxide. And at the same time, when we get this, we have a full oxide. So we have just the valence band, as you can see. In each of them, only the valence band. There is no defect band left. So that's, that's how we went from uh, pure metal to a terminal oxide. And I assumed here, uh, in this region, that the intensity or the area under the peak for the valence band and the defect band uh, should be 1. Then, of course, we can deconvolute the peak, as I said, using the peak fitting procedure, and get quantitatively uh, the relative uh, amount of various oxidation states or various oxide phases in the film. So you can see the upper uh, part of the panel is pure metals. Then the lower panel is the terminal oxides. And in between, we have the intermediate states, which are the most interesting part uh, of this talk. And if we follow the oxidation, we can see very nice rise, as I said, as I show you, of the valence band and simultaneously reduction of the metallic or the defect band. And then what we did, we took the samples out of the machine and we did van der Poel measurements of transport in those layers, specifically uh, resistivity and temperature coefficient of resistance. And of course, we can see very nicely what happens as we oxidize the, movie, uh, the, the, the films. And I decided to scale the transport with the uh, valence band intensity. Uh, because pr in principle, valence band intensity signifies the uh, insulating part of the film, whereas the defect band or the D band uh, symbolizes the conducting part. And of course, the, if, if I scaled it with the uh, D band intensity, I would get just the mirror image of what you see here. So what you see is the more oxygen we put, so uh, the higher the intensity of the 2P valence band, so the resistivity raises, as we can see, uh, the blue line. And at the same time, the temperature coefficient of resistance uh, decreases. And we know that in metals, uh, temperature coefficient of resistance is, and I will refer to it from now on as TCR, just to save time. So the TCR is positive, and in semiconductors and insulators is negative. And we can see the red line indicates the transition from metal to semiconductor, or metal to insulator, if you will. Then I scaled it with temperature resistivity, or conductivity in this case, uh, scaled with temperature. And the reason why, uh, and the reason to do it is because I wanted to see what is the uh, conduction mechanism, what is the main dominating conduction mechanism. And it turns out that it's uh, the so-called hopping conduction, introduced by Mott and Anderson, actually for what they got their Nobel Prize. And the best way to imagine a Fermi glass, which is the, our layer, is by thinking of raisin cake. And the raisin cake, whereas every raisin is basically a conduction center, uh, and the mass in between is an amorphous and uh, insulating mass. In which case, okay, the conductance or the conductivity Will, will be, as this uh, equation, Mott's equation describes, depends on the uh, physical separation between the conducting centers and basically the activation barriers to hop from one conduction side to another. You can see it here. And uh, the variable range hopping means that basically there is a finite probability for the electron to hop not only to a site nearest to it in space, but also to a site nearest to its an energy. So that's why it's called variable range. But in that case, uh, if we talk about logarithm, logarithmic conductivity, it, uh, the power of the temperature will scale as 
you can see here, it's a dimensionality argument. In other words, for three-dimensional variable range hopping, we're supposed to get t to the minus one quarter. And uh, when I fitted it, the best fit was indeed with t to the minus one, one quarter. In other words, what we saw here uh, is the variable range hopping conduction uh, in a Fermi glass. Now, if you fit that from the slope, we can get the uh, uh, density of uh, electronic states at the Fermi level, because I wish to remind you that we have all these electronic states here at the Fermi level. Okay, this is the Fermi level in each of them, and we have a peak here. So we can estimate this density from that fitting. And once we have it, we can calculate the hopping distance and the hopping energy using this equation. And I did that. And now we can check the scaling of those parameters of the hopping length and the hopping energy with uh, oxidation or with the intensity of the valence band. So this is the tabulation. Uh, these are the graphs. And the blue line indicates the metal uh, to variable range hopping con uh, transition. And then uh, the yellow indicates the variable range hopping to the nearest range, uh, nearest neighbor hopping. And the reason is, as we oxidize more and more, the distance between the conducting centers gets bigger and bigger. In fact, they become so sparse, eventually, that they become very localized, because there is no longer overlap of the wave function. And this alpha here is the inverse decay length, which is in the real space would correspond to a localization radius. So what we can see here is a very nice understanding of how the um, conduction gets from metallic, which is very good, to variable range, then to nearest uh, neighbor uh, hopping range as the localization grows higher. And eventually, even the percolation breaks down because uh, they are so sparse that they cannot form even a, a percolating pattern. And so I fitted this with the percolation equation. This is the percolation equation. X is basically the concentration of the conduction center. And this is the some critical concentration below which we cannot form percolating pattern. And when I fitted that, tantalum fitted greatly because it's supposed to be around 15 angstrom, the threshold for the percolation, and the power should be around 1.5. So this is really, and you see the good fit here, this is really behave uh, as a percolating um, uh, medium. Uh, with tungsten oxide, it was worse. You can see here, it breaks down here. And with uh, niobium, it was even worse because niobium do doesn't have that region of variable range hopping. It is so strongly localized up front that it's immediately in the nearest neighbor hopping regime. You can see it here, okay? It doesn't have that, uh, 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 that region of um, low, um, of small hopping lengths and energies. It starts right away in the nearest neighbor hopping and gets up to the percolation threshold. So the model I uh, suggested is the following. When we have the metal, even though amorphous, it doesn't matter, it still have very good um, um, overlap of the wave functions. And that happens when we have the metallic and only metallic uh, doublet in core levels. And in the valence band, we have the D band. And this is the pure metal. Then as we begin to oxidize, they uh, drive farther apart from each other. And we have transition to a variable range hopping regime. And you can see that because we begin to get here the first intermediate oxide and also the beginning of the formation of the valence band here at the expense of some intensity of the um, D band or the defect band later on. And then it continues as we oxidize it more and more in the nearest neighbor hopping and we see what's going on here. The trend continues absolutely in the same manner until eventually uh, they are so sparse that there is no overlap whatsoever between the wave function. And the full localization basically causes, uh, sorry, still 
percolating pattern can be formed, but we can, rarely, we can hardly see what used to be the D band and the defect band, and we see a very large uh, valence band. And finally, when the percolation breaks down, and that's the high resistance state, we have a uh, doublet, doublet of a pure terminal oxide, and no longer defect band, we have just a pure insulator. And uh, the first, the left part, is simple, it's metal, we all know it, and the last one is insulator, we also know it very well. The most interesting part here, which is the Fermi glass, where we have this hopping conduction. And so what, 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 um, what the suggestion was is that that's what happens in the conducting channel of tantalum oxide. In other words, it gets oxygen in and out of the channel, and that's how it transforms from high resistance state by extracting the oxygen out of the channel into low resistance state, and then the oxygen back in the channel, back to the low resist high resistance state. So on off, on off, or set reset, if you will. And furthermore, to understand what are these conduction centers, we tried to do and then we found a theoretical paper, Baram Prasad, who calculated various oxygen vacancies, where they should be in the gap. And the gap is four electron volts, as you can see here. So our uh, defect band is two electron volts above the valence band maximum, as you can see here. And that corresponds, miraculously, at least according to calculation, to this oxygen atom here, or vacancy, when this atom becomes vacancy, this is the uh, in-plane uh, oxygen vacancy, and that's what gives the uh, two electron volt band within the band gap. So I've tried <coughs> to publish it in Nature unsuccessfully. I suspect that my Israel affiliation had something to do with it, because when I left, the guys from the lab submitted it, and here you see it published in Nature Nanotechnology, that model that I suggested. But anyhow, it's now recognized. That's the model. And uh, that was our working hypothesis. And now we wanted to prove or to find more experimental proof that it works this way. So what we did for this is we switched a um, device on. And then we tried to locate where the conducting channel formed. And basically, to do the post-mortem anatomy, to dissect uh, that channel. For this, we used the so-called non-conducting um, uh, pressure-modulated conductive microscopy. So that's an AFM tip, which is not conducting, which scans the device. And at the same time, the resistivity is measured. Now, when the device pressurizes the conducting channel, there is a dip of resistivity there. And you can see it here. So now, when we found it, we can use a uh, focused ion beam in order to dissect it and prepare uh, for TM. And you can see here the TM cross-sectional image of the conducting channel. Okay. And what we did now is uh, ILS in order to uh, found, uh, exp uh, explore the composition of the channel. And you can see here the ILS along this green line. This is the oxygen L edge. So you can see that oxygen goes down as we progress into the conducting channel. So you see here the top electrode tantalum, bottom electrode platinum, between you have the layer. And you see that here the oxygen goes down. And if we dissect it and, and uh, profile the oxygen concentration upwards, so annularly, we can see also that it goes down as we get towards the center of the channel. Furthermore, what you see here is the so-called X-ray spectral microscopy which also sensed a tantalum-rich region of about 100 nanometers here, surrounded by tantalum, amorphous uh, tantalum oxide. So you see, um, I think it uh, quite convincingly shows the channel to be oxygen poor after switching it to, to, the, off, to the on state. Another interesting detail that I can point is that everything here is amorphous except for this crystallite here. And we took the diffraction and and it turns out to be the high temperature 
uh, tantalum pentoxide phase, which is called beta. Uh, the low temperature called alpha, tantalum pentoxide, this is beta, tantalum pentoxide. And the formation temperature of this phase is about 800 degrees centigrade minimum. So we could also estimate that quite a significant heating took place during the switching operation here. And that's material to the model, as you will see. So the model is this. We see here uh, resistivity and temp the temperature coefficient of resistance as a function of oxygen. And what I'm saying is that in the on state, we have a metallic conducting channel with no oxygen in. And in the off state, it is oxidized, and therefore we have uh, the uh, tantalum oxide phase. And in between, all this region is basically a mixture, a two-phase mixture, very simple, as the simplest phase diagram one can imagine. We teach that our student on the basic course. And this basically mixture of two phases. This one is the conducting one, which is basically metal with some oxygen dissolved in it. And this is the insulator. So the resistivity here is determined by the lever rule, which we use in order to deduce quantitatively the amount of each phase in the mixture. And furthermore, so what can we do with this? So now we, what we can do with this, go directly to this, is we can do not only binary switch, we can do switch with multiple states. And the way to do it is to use the so-called 1T1M circuit, which is one thermistor, one transistor, sorry, one transistor, one memristor. And by gating with different voltages, we can let the desired amount of oxygen into the channel. And in the same on state, as we can see here, we can have different on states, okay, and different off states, simply by using different gating. So to switch it on, we need plus one volt in this case, okay, and by using simultaneously different gating voltages here of the FET, this is a FET, uh, we could form this um, very interesting multi-state switch. Okay, I'll skip all that. So the model, and, and now the question is how it gets how the oxygen gets in and out of the channel? Well, this is the tricky part. So uh, what we know, it's not like, uh, like in titanium oxide, uh, which is uh, the conduction determined by this, band gap, by this gap and the modulation of this gap by oxidation. And this is a very simple model. So if you put plus on titanium, it will attract oxygen and ions and form a Schottky barrier, and they'll increase it, and they will have the high resistance state, and vice versa. But it's not what happens, and it doesn't happen in uh, tantalum oxide, and we can see this because both off and on resistance states are nearly linear, the IV, so we see that it's not a Schottky behavior. So our model is this. Of course, uh, when we apply plus voltage on the tantalum electrode, we attract the oxygen anions. And at the same time, heating takes place. And the Soray effect, or thermophoresis, sweeps the oxygen out of the channel, as you can see here. Okay. And of course, when we switch it to the on, in other words, uh, we put minus here, off, sorry, minus on the tantalum electrode and plus on the platinum electrode, we have the opposite effect as described here. So oxygen is swept in and down. And we want to check this out, actually. This is what we are going to do now, here, not now. But I mean, um, fortunately, we got a nice grant. I'm done here. And we are going to establish now this research in Israel. And we're going to check the, checked out more uh, to the uh, more vigorously what's going on. And one of the things, one of the things I want to start with is by taking hafnium oxide, because hafnium oxide has very similar phase diagram to tantalum oxide. And if you get the same excellent performance of hafnium oxide memristor, this is, will be another 
uh, evidence of the correctness of our model. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Very much so. I didn't accentuate it, but just to show you, it is very, very much dependent on the. And by the way, one of the advantages of this Mimristor technology over flash is the scalability. So we can scale it down to a few nanometers. Come on. Yes, okay, this is the one. So you see, we, uh, one of them, so we did either um, disks of 100 uh, nanometer width, or we did those crossbars, as you can see here, which is 50 nanometer pitch. And also the thickness of the layer was different. Now for the big device, this is the IV curve. And for the nanometer device, this is the IV curve. The most important parameter is the current. So the switching current, of course, which is uh, very important because we want to scale down the uh, energy consumption. Here we're talking about milliamps, while in the nanometric one we're talking about microamps. So this is a huge advantage of the nano devices, nano uh, crossbars over large devices. That's another advantage of this Memristor concept. It's very, very promising. No, it started in 2008. I can tell you one thing. Last time I talked to the HP guys, they asked me, what do you think is the next big thing? Because they're already over in Restore. It's going to be in production. A Korean company called Hynix is in charge of a huge you know, Japanese, uh, um, Korean concern conglomerate is going to produce it, and they said that within a couple of years it should be in production, so they're no longer interested in Memristor because they're looking for the next big thing. In Israel, very few people even heard about this. So we are a little bit uh, behind in this sense. Yes. Uh, no, it's very, very much non-volatile. So once it's out, so the, the uh, let's say if it's out, so we have a non-state. It has a very low resistance. So if if you look at the if, if this um, at this curve, you see that it's very, very non-volatile. So in order to get it. Back, you need to get from here, basically to here. Electric, it's, we think it's, it's, it's combined electric and thermal field. So it's electric field vertically between the electrodes and thermophoretic uh, annular, so annular motion. <laughs> 